Let's get ready to mortgage. He is the prince of programs, guru of guidelines, master of matrixes. He puts the fun in funding. Please welcome Mark, Mr. Mortgage, I tell. All right. Hey, guys, it's Mark Itel here, and you are listening to The Mr. Mortgage Show. Guys, we do this each week right here, same bat time, same bat station, and you are in the right place if you have questions and you want answers. Not the crazy headlines, but real solid answers. The data, the tips, the tricks, the strategies, all the info that you need so you can go out and make better real estate and mortgage decisions for you and your family. If that's you, you are in the right place. Guys, we have an awesome, awesome show lined up for you this week. I've been deep diving the data and uh, reading a bunch of reports, watching interviews this week. Truly fascinating by what's happening in the interest rate environment. We've seen a pullback. We've seen a spike in mortgage applications and a big jump in refi applications, which a lot of people find counterintuitive, but with rates pulling back into the low sevens and some loan programs into the low sixes, it's giving people an opportunity primarily around debt consolidation refis. And I know it's so, so very counterintuitive to think that raising your interest rate could actually save you money. And from a global monthly debt expenditure, yes, it still can. So if you have any curiosity around debt consolidation and if it makes sense, you can go to REC, R-E-C, REC, REFI, R-E-C-R-E-F-I dot com. There's a calculator there that we put up at that website. You don't have to sign up for anything or give us your information. It's free to use. Share it with anybody who you think might be curious about this, but you can walk yourself through the debt uh, consolidation calculation standpoint to see if it makes sense from a monthly savings. So that was interesting this week. We did see that spike in refi applications. And right now in this environment, It's primarily around that debt consolidation piece. And we've seen it in our own practice. So I wasn't surprised to see that. Although I was a bit surprised to see that it was a double digit increase. So we're going to watch that carefully because, you know, there are a lot of triggers in consumer data you know, the high credit card balances, the high credit card interest rates, the strain that that's putting on the consumer. It's very logical that all that is translating for the homeowner anyway, into a debt consolidation scenario, rather than, you know, letting a car be repossessed or going into bankruptcy, because that those have long-term negative impacts um, on your credit and on your credit score that most people will try to avoid at almost any cost. So we are definitely going to watch that. But Hey, this is the information that I found super fascinating this week. The age difference in homeowners today versus traditionally, I found fascinating. And we're going to tie all of this back. I promise it's going to be a little bit of a winding road, but we're going to tie it all the way back to the big, big difference in young single men versus young single women buying their first home because historically women have outpaced men in home ownership, single women versus single men, but at a greater pace lately. And we usually do it around national women's week or women's day. I think it's a week. At least it is in my world. We're celebrating the women for, for more than one day, but we usually tie this data set around that holiday, if you will, But it's interesting because each time that we dive into it, the difference between the genders continues to grow. That gap does. And I think you'll find this interesting. Meredith Whitney, you guys hear me uh, reference her data quite often. She's on CNBC. And this week was no different. She was on CNBC again, and she shared some very interesting data around sports betting and the growth of sports betting and what that's doing to the first time buyer. And I'm going to admit, I n- never put any correlation together. I'm, I, I don't use online sports betting and I'm not a young single guy. So it never crossed my mind that those correlations existed. Although convenience spending certainly has slowed the savings rate of the first time buyer. So we've seen like the, you know, the $5 coffees 
and the Grubhub and Uber Eats deliveries cutting into people's budgets and making it more difficult for that younger generation who uses those convenience apps to save the money necessary to buy that first home. So I guess it just makes sense that as now sports betting has opened up um, across the country, that more and more people are using that and it's another place that they're spending money instead of saving money. And it also makes sense that men disproportionately gravitate to those type of apps versus women because sports and sports betting is traditionally a guy thing. But here's where I found it really fascinating. I guess we can touch on this. Let me first throw this out there. I found this really, really scary and also interesting. 74% of the homeowners in the country today are over 50 years old. 74% are over 50. Man, that's really, really startling to me. Now, if you bump that age down to 40, 90%, according to Meredith Whitney, her data set that was on CNBC, 90% of homeowners are over 40 years old. So that leaves just 10% of 30-somethings and younger owning real estate. And that's mind blowing to me because we're pushing that age entry point of the first time buyer farther and farther out and they're becoming older and having less time to build equity. And that's concerning in the long run because I don't care what the online gurus say. It's not better to rent and invest. It's better to own your home if that monthly payment is equivalent to rent. Now, if you can save a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars a month by renting versus buying in your area and you can invest that other monies i get it but if mathematically it's a similar cost to rent versus own you should own first and then go out there and invest in my humble opinion and that's based on the equity position that i've seen people build over time and a lot of those gurus will use the 20 percent down payment and say well if the house is 400,000 and you've got to put 20% down, that 80 grand is better at work somewhere else. Well, you don't have to put 20% down to buy a house. You could put 3.5% down and use an FHA loan in the very low sixes today. That's just an average. I'm not quoting rates here, but those rates are available. You can go to Mortgage News Daily and see it for yourself. You can go to mrmortgageradio.com and scroll to the bottom of the page. The national averages are posted there every day. So in my opinion, that's the better route to go build that equity because equity makes a huge difference. But here's where I'm going with this. Sports betting is exploding. Disproportionately young men are participating in sports betting and the largest number of young gentlemen as per Pew research, historically, the largest number of young men are single and have no interest in dating. And it made me think, are, are all the young guys sitting at home on DraftKings betting on fantasy sports while the girls are out taking selfies in front of the Taylor Swift um, banners at the concerts and nobody's interested in buying? I, it's, it, the whole thing was fascinating to me, but it tied it all back together where you can see that young people are just either distracted by these other experiences in life and somehow in our society we've made them so valuable that home ownership is put on the back burner and do the rest of us just sound like we're you know it's a sales pitch by trying to convince them to consider home ownership i'm not sure but i found all of it super super interesting and the data kind of tied it all together for me with in particular young women outpacing young men in buying homes and building equity, that's because all the young guys are out there, you know, fantasy footballing their day away or playing Fortnite or whatever the case may be. So I just wanted to share that and we can dive into all that data on this week's show as well as answer all your questions. Guys, you hear the music though, you know what that means? That's my cue. We'll be back in a few on the other side of this very, very short break. We'll be back with more of the Mr. Mortgage Show. 
Hey, it's Mark Itell, host of the Mr. Mortgage Show, and I'm going to interrupt this commercial break to ask you for a favor. If you know any friends, family, coworkers, or the guy in front of you at the grocery line who's talking or thinking about buying or selling or refinancing real estate, I'm hoping I can count on you to help me spread the word, introduce them to me, to the team. You can do that by simply sharing MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. Guys, it's Mark Itell, NMLS 1929005. Now, back to the commercials. Welcome back to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Call us now at 855-462-7292. All right, we are back. My name is Mark Itell, and you, wow, I sounded like, <laughs> and you, and you are listening to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Guys, I went through that whole first segment and forgot to give you the phone numbers. If you have questions or comments, if you want to get involved in the show, we welcome your participation. Uh, questions or comments, just call or text 855 855- 462-7292. That is the Anytime Hotline. 855-462-7292. Jen, my producer, is standing by womaning the Anytime Hotline, and she'll get your questions on the air one more time. 855-462-7292. Or just head over to MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. In addition to the daily rate and news feed updates, which you'll find on the bottom of the page is a big orange button right in the middle of the page under my ugly mug that says get your questions on the air if you click that button you can send your questions over that way just follow the instructions they'll pop up on our screen and Jen will read them on the air for you that again is uh, mrmortgageradio.com but guys a lot of interesting data this week around the big age difference in home ownership, which really, really blew my mind. Because if you think about the equity position that you build over a lifetime, it makes sense that the earlier you get involved, the better off you are. And I know interest rates are the conversation and housing prices are the conversation of the day. And it's easy to point fingers at those two things and say, you know, it's, it's not affordable right now. And that's why I'm waiting. I get it. And that makes sense, but are you saving while you're waiting or are you on these sports betting sites and, you know, spending a thousand dollars on a concert ticket and just making it more and more unlikely that you'll be ready if prices or rates come back down. And we've seen a big pullback in rates. I mean, it's really exciting now with an interest rate bouncing around 7%. And I say that because... You know, the FHA and VA loans traditionally have a lower interest rate, and those are in the mid to low sixes right now today as we're doing the show. Again, those averages can be found on the website and conventional right around that 7% mark, which means with a rate buy down, you can get a, a rate that starts with a six down to a rate that starts with a five. And if you do a three, two, one buy down, man, you can take a rate that's, you know, 7% and move it to four. We're talking about pretty attractive rates again. That's not the, the barrier of entry that it was just as recently as a few months ago. And prices are holding, guys. We've seen it. We talk about it. We beat it to death, supply and demand. So it's, it's just interesting. I think people need to watch a little more carefully the details and not the headlines. I wanted to throw that out there only because every time we see a pullback, we see that translate to a spike in activity. And by the time you're seeing it in the headlines, that data is usually about a week old. So I'm trying to bring you the fresh stuff here, the hot out of the oven, fresh stuff. But uh, I appreciate you letting me dive into all of that. I'm really worried about the young single guys, though, because guys, that Axe body spray and that One Direction concert shirt might make you look and smell cool. But ladies like equity, brother. Think about it. Think about it because the ladies are out there buying houses. All right, guys. Thanks for allowing me to uh, have a little bit of fun with that topic. I always do. It's interesting. The older people are owning homes longer, it seems, than usual. And the younger people are waiting longer to get involved. But the ladies, it's no surprise, smarten up a little quicker and are 
making home ownership a reality at a faster pace than young single guys. And, you know, that Meredith Whitney data set alluded to sports betting as a possible spending distraction. So anyway, I had fun tying all that together. But speaking of fun, let's throw it over to Jen and get some questions on the air because I know this part of the show is always fun. Go ahead, Jen. Jay sent this one. Can I get an FHA loan on a house that has a well and a septic tank instead of city water? Hey, Jay, this is a great, great question. Um, I need a little bit more information for clarity, but I'm going to do my best to kind of give you both answers, right? Because there's two potential answers here. Now, on the surface, FHA is perfectly okay with well and septic. Now, that assumes that well and septic isn't available or required by the city, which is kind of part two of this answer. But let's table that for a minute. The well and septic tank are not an issue with the guidelines in particular. Now, there is an additional requirement to determine the distance between the well and the septic tank, which I believe for most people makes perfect sense because you don't want your well too close to the septic or you're going to have... Uh, uh, let's face it, funny tasting water. So FHA requires the well be a certain distance away from the septic tank. Now, assuming that that guideline is met by the distance between the two and they're both in good working order, then the guidelines alone won't prohibit it. Matter of fact, we write FHA loans on properties with well and septic all the time. And it's a non-issue, but we go through that additional protocol make sure there's adequate pressure from the well sometimes a septic tank inspection may be required that's usually tied to a property that's been vacant for a long time which i know kind of is counterintuitive but i believe a dry tank is more susceptible to needing maintenance than an actively used tank an actively used tank might need to be pumped out but i think the dry tank is where they run into challenges so with that being said on the surface the well and septic are not a problem now you heard me allude to the fact that what if the city now offers well and septic this is where it's a little more confusing because if the city offers and requires it Let's say there's septic leaching into wetlands or into navigable water. There's been times where the city's converted neighborhoods over because of problems with septic tanks. If that's the case and it's available and required by the city, then you may have to have the hookups in place prior to closing, meaning that the guidelines would require water and sewer hookup in that instance. So it's not that the guidelines don't allow it. It's that if the city and water are available and required, then the guideline kicks in that it is required. So I hope that makes sense. I know it's not a clear cut answer either way, but I wanted to cover both of those. And just for clarity, if the city water and sewer are available at what's deemed an affordable cost and the affordable cost by the FHA guidelines, if I remember correctly, I'm doing this for memory, I believe is 3% of the transaction price or the value of the property. So let's say you're buying a $300,000 house. If the city will hook you up for less than $9,000, then the guidelines may require that you hook to the city water and sewer. That's the only other part I wanted to throw in there. There is a cost threshold. If it's more expensive to do it than that 3% rule, you may not be required to do it unless the municipality is requiring it for whatever other environmental reasons. But most often, the hookup is less than that 3% number because the city is aware of the guidelines. But that's a great question. I don't get that one often. And I always, always enjoy kind of stretching my brain, a little gray matter flex there. So thank you for that one. Oh, guys, you hear the music? You know what that means? That is my cue. We'll be back in a few. Sit tight on the other side of this very short break. We'll be back with more of your questions and more of the Mr. Mortgage Show. Welcome back to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Call us now at 855-462-7292. 
All right, we are back. My name is Mark Itel, and you are listening to The Mr. Mortgage Show. Guys, if you have questions or comments, please shoot them over. You can do that by calling or texting 855-462-7292. That's 855-462-7292. That is the Anytime Hotline, and Jen is womaning the hotline, and she'll get your questions on the air. Again, that's 855-462-7292. And guys... We call it the Anytime Hotline because it is ringing right here live while we're in the studio, but that forwards to my office the rest of the time. So you can get us on that number anytime. Or if you prefer, you can head over to MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com and shoot your questions over that way. You can't miss the big orange button. Click that big orange button, follow the instructions. We'll see your question on this side and Jen will read it on the air for you. But hey, we've got a few questions on the log. So let me throw it over to Jen and we'll kind of keep this rolling. Hey, Jen, are you ready? Okay, go ahead. Nellie emailed us. If I sell my house and let the buyer assume my mortgage, am I still responsible for the mortgage? I mean, will it stay on my credit report? Hey, Nellie, this is a great, great question. So here's the thing. This whole assumable mortgage is so very misunderstood. And I'm talking to agents even every day that don't completely understand how an assumption works and what's the difference between assuming a mortgage and quote unquote taking it over which a lot of investors are out there making offers on properties, quote, subject to the mortgage saying, hey, I'll give you a down payment or I'm going to ask you to hold a second mortgage and I will take over your mortgage. I'm buying your property subject to the existing mortgage staying in place. And guys, I'm not a fan of that. And I know there are a lot of investors out there who will argue with me until I'm blue in the face or until they're blue in the face. But if you sell your property subject to, and you transfer the deed, which is the ownership interest, like the title to your car, the deed to your home, if you transfer that to the buyer and allow them to make the mortgage payments for you, they've not assumed the loan. It's still your loan. They own your house. You're responsible for the debt. So what happens if they miss a mortgage payment or they stop making a mortgage payment? You're being pulled into foreclosure because that promissory note, that mortgage instrument that you signed is in your name. The deed is now in theirs and it becomes a very, very ugly, painstaking process. So if you're going to own the debt, You need to own the asset. I say it all the time. So if you're talking about that type of quote unquote assumption, which it's not an assumption, somebody saying I'll take over your mortgage, then yes, it's going to remain on your credit and you are going to remain obligated. A true assumption happens when a buyer contacts your mortgage servicer, not the original mortgage company, not their bank, not even our company. If your buyer calls us, we can't help with an assumption. It's the servicer. The company that you make your mortgage payment to each month, call that 800 number and ask for the assumption department. That's who originates an assumption. And it's not even an origination because origination means a new loan. It's facilitating the assumption. It happens by the servicer in their assumption department. So they don't go out and get approved from their local bank or local mortgage company. They call your servicer's assumption department and get approved for the assumption through the servicer. And then they take over the obligation of that debt. It's now in the the buyer's name. It's a new loan with the same existing terms that you have, whatever remaining balance is, whatever the remaining number of payments are at the current interest rate. They take that over. You're released from all obligation at that point, and then it does not show up on your credit report. So big, big difference, subject to versus assumption, and the terminology is often so close it's confusing. If someone wants to take over your mortgage, very rarely are they truly assuming the mortgage. So anybody out there with questions regarding this and need clarification, please call my office. We'll walk you through it because as a seller, if you don't own the asset, you should not keep the debt in your name. And an assumption gets the asset and the debt out of your name 
a subject to sale or allowing someone to quote unquote take over the mortgage usually keeps the debt in your name. So I hope that helps. Hey, Jen, throw me another question. Dominic left this on the hotline. What is the maximum amount for a VA loan? We are looking at a home just over a million and would prefer 100% financing if it's available. One million dollars. Guys, I did the Dr. Evil with the pinky on my cheek and everything. Hey, Dominic, great news. The maximum loan amount is now based on your ability to repay. So we've got one channel that will allow us to fund 100% VA loans up to $3 million. There are some out there that'll even go to $5 million. So the days of being capped are well, well behind us and going up to $3 million with 100% financing with a VA loan is definitely, definitely doable. So you should be fine. And guys, people think that someone would be crazy to borrow 100% at these interest rates today. Well, the VA loan today is probably around 6%, six and a quarter. I don't have it in front of me while we're doing the show, but that's where we've been trending. And let's just say for argument's sake, that's where it is. Well, if Dominic has assets performing at an return higher than 6%, why would he tie that cash up in the property if his net return on that cash is higher somewhere else? And some people just like the freedom of having that additional liquidity and borrowing 100%. I know, I mean, that's the sign and drive mentality of leasing a car. People do it every day. That freedom, that comfort of having the cash in the bank. And hey, I'm glad we're having this conversation because we talked a little bit earlier about FHA loans. And in the past, FHA and VA had gotten a bad rap. Like anybody who's not putting a down payment down must be a shaky borrower and this loan won't close. Well, guys, we've done mortgages in excess of $2 million for veterans who could pay cash, absolutely could have paid cash for the property, but preferred to get that historically low interest rate and borrow 100%. So just because they're not putting anything down doesn't mean that they're not capable of of it. And why would you if you don't have to? So brilliant question. I hope that helps. Um, you will be good to go, uh, certainly under $3 million and with some lenders under $5 million. But brilliant question. Hey, Jen, let's get another one in. Annie has this question. I watched your refinance video. If I go this route and do a rec refi, can we also do a rate buy down? It seems like it'll save us a lot of money each month. Hey, smarty pants, Annie. Very, very good question. That's actually quite a brilliant question. So yes, you can. You can do a refinance and use some of the equity to buy your rate down. And where rates are today, you could do a permanent buy down in the very low sixes or maybe even the high fives, depending on you know, if you're listening to the show live or the podcast, um, anybody who wants to check that out can go watch that very same video or at least the video I'm assuming Annie watched um, at recrefi.com. That's recrefi.com. And we talked about it in the opening segment. A lot of people are seeing the advantage of doing a debt consolidation loan now that rates have pulled back a little bit. And guys, I get it. They're still double of what they were not too long ago. And that makes it a challenge mentally to say, God, I'm going to give up my three and a half or my 4% rate for a 6% rate. But if you're saving hundreds or thousands of dollars a month in other debt, then yeah, it might make sense. It might give you the relief you need each month to get back on track and start saving some money or maybe use some money for another investment opportunity. But anyway, to answer your question, Annie, yes, you can use the rate buy down strategy in conjunction with the rec refinance and guys go to recrefi.com if you want to use the calculator for yourself and see if it makes sense hey jen can you oh no more questions i hear the music you know what that means guys that's my cue we'll be back in a few sit tight on the other side of this very short break we'll be back with more of the mr mortgage show welcome back to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Call us now at 855-462-7292. 
All right, we are back. My name is Mark Itell, and you are listening to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Hey, if you have questions or comments, just call or text 855-462-7292. That's 855-462-7292. That is the Anytime Hotline. Jen is womaning the hotline, and she'll get your questions on the air. If you prefer, you can head over to MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com, and right in the middle of the screen is a big orange button that says get your questions on the air just click that button type them in right there they'll pop up on our end and jen will read them on the air for you but i know we've got some lined up already because i have been a rambling and a bambling and a talking a lot today so let me throw it over to jen hey jen go ahead with another question there is no name on this one why do i have to provide my detailed bank statements when applying for a mortgage I mean, my spending habits are personal and I'm uncomfortable letting someone see this. Is there a way I can just show the balances? Um, I get it, right? We're all super, super concerned about our personal information. And now with everything being debit cards, everything is on your bank statements. And I get it. There's some weird things we see, truly. In addition to all the weird websites, the the dating sites, the OnlyFans, the betting sites. the It's crazy. I get it. The good news is nobody who's looking at that cares, if that helps. And nobody who's looking at that hasn't already seen it on someone else's. So it's a necessary evil. And the reason you can't, and I guess the answer to the question is no, I should have started there. But the reason you can't get away with just balances, that's because those can be manipulated. You could be broke all month and borrow five grand and deposit it in the account and show a $5,000 balance and then repay that five grand and go do it again next month or whatever the denomination is. It's irrelevant, but you can manipulate the balances. And that's what's happening when your bank statements are being underwritten. It's not what you're spending it on. It's the consistency of inflow and outflow. So they're looking for anomalies, big expenditures or big deposits, because if suddenly there's a $25,000 deposit, you're going to be asked to explain that because is that a loan from Uncle Vinny so that you've got the assets to buy it? And if it is, then you can't use borrowed funds as a down payment. So that's what's happening is it's not so much to scrutinize the personal nature of your expenditures. It's to evaluate the consistency and look for any large outflows or inflows that may require explanation. So the answer to your question is no, um, I get it. It's uncomfortable, but it's like going to the doctor. There's probably just a small percentage of the population that are proud how they look naked. The rest of us are uncomfortable in front of the doctor, but you know, he or she's already seen it all. So it's, it's not a big difference. We all just drop them and cough and get through it. And that's kind of the same thing. So I hope that helps, but no, there's no way around that if you're using a traditional loan program, but thank you for the question. Hey, Jen, throw me another one. Joanne sent this one. I'm recently divorced and was a stay at home mom for the last 15 years. I'm just getting back to work and I'm wondering how long it'll be before I can buy a house. Technically, I can pay cash with my settlement, but I really don't want to. Okay, Joanne, this is a great question. And that last little bit of information completely changes the answer. So most loan programs, and I'm going to start and we're going to hold off on that second piece for a minute. Most loan programs are going to require two years work history. Some as little as one but most of the time, 24 months worth of work history. But here's where you completely changed the equation. You said you could pay cash. There are loan programs called asset depletion loans that will take all of that cash that you have from the settlement that you could use to buy the house. And I get it. We just talked about the veteran in the last segment of the show who wants to borrow 100% and keep all that cash in the bank. Having that cash in the bank gives us a little peace of mind. So I totally get that you wouldn't want to spend it all on the house. But here's the thing. You take that lump sum of cash, those assets, the liquid assets that you have, and this applies to more than just cash on hand. If you've got retirement accounts, you take that number and divide it by 84 months, and that's the monthly income 
that's used when determining your debt to income ratio. So then the employment side of things is a non-issue because you could pay cash and you can use an asset depletion loan for the income calculations. Then the employment side of it goes out of the window. Now there's another loan program that is similar, but, and I don't remember the acronym off the top of my head, but again, having the ability to pay cash allows you access to the loan program. So one is asset depletion and assuming that number divided by 84 months is enough income to support the purchase, you're good to go. The, the other loan program just takes into consideration that you could pay for it and they'll loan you the money based on that. Now, there's other credit criteria, credit score, the whole nine yards, but the income side of it and the employment side of it can be solved by the fact that you have those assets. So brilliant, brilliant question, and it's perfect. It's perfect for this scenario. So if you have any questions and you'd like to dive a little bit deeper, I'd welcome the opportunity uh, to talk with you off the air. Just uh, call or text and we'll set up a call. But great, great question. Thank you for that. Hey, Jen, throw me another question. Alicia used the website. I've heard you talking about a rate buy down, saving us money every month. I like this idea. What is the best way to ask a seller for this? Thanks. Hey, Alicia. That was Alicia. Okay. This is a great, great strategy right now in today's market. As things have slowed down, sellers are more willing in most markets, not all of them. I just talked to my friend Anna up in uh, Pennsylvania and she's still getting multiple offers on her uh, listing. So in her area, it's still a super hot market, but the rest of us are dealing with a normalizing market. And in these markets, the sellers are more willing to lower the price or help with closing costs. So the best way from my experience to do it is if you're looking at, let's use round numbers. If you're looking at a house that's $500,000 and you think you can buy it for 480, instead of offering 480 and then start negotiating all of these other bits and pieces, if you're truly willing to pay 480 for the property, offer them the 500,000 with a $20,000 seller contribution to be used for buyer's closing costs, third-party fees, non-allowables, and interest rate buy-down. If your agent crafts the language somewhere around that sentence, then the money can be used for more than just the buy-down. Then you can spread it wherever you need it. So brilliant, brilliant strategy in today's market. And guys, lowering the rate by as little as one percentage point reduces the monthly payment far greater than reducing the sales price by $20,000. And we can do that math for you if you're interested. It's mind blowing to see what the cost of interest does to a monthly payment. I guess it's not. We've seen it over the last, what, 12 months as interest rates have continued to tick up, fewer and fewer people are qualifying. So great, great question. Hey, Jen, let's try to get another one in. Randy called this one in. I'm very interested in buying a house and assuming a low interest rate. Is there an easy way to find homes with assumable mortgages? Hey, Randy, you are not alone, my man. Everybody is out there hunting that needle in the haystack, right? And there's a ton of them out there. The vast majority of people have interest rates far, far below five and 6%, most below four. So it's mind blowing. Um, super exciting. A platform just launched. I think they're in four or five states right now, but they're rolling it out nationwide eventually, but it's, they're moving pretty quickly. It's called Rome. I'll post the link to the Facebook page. Go to MrMortgageRadio.com and click on the Facebook link and I'll pin it to the top of the Facebook page, the actual homepage. But Rome, if you search um, Assumable Mortgages Rome, R-O-A-M, it'll take you to the website. But I'll post a direct link to it because I think that's a brilliant, brilliant solution. And you hear me say it all the time, guys, in every obstacle is opportunity. And these guys went out there and created a online presence around people hunting for assumable mortgages. And the math is staggering to see how much money you can actually save by assuming a mortgage versus paying today's interest rate. 
but yeah, I'll post the link to Rome on the Facebook page because I'm not exactly sure the name of the URL. But man, you hear the music? You know what that means? Wow. Where does the time go when you give me a microphone? Guys, thanks for hanging out with us this week. We had a great time with you on the air. Jen is waving back there. She's ready to hit the road. Man, we've had a great time. If you need us when we're not on the air, check out MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. One more time for the kids in the back. Mr. MortgageRadio.com. Otherwise, guys, have an awesome, awesome week. We will be back next week, same time, same station. That's a wrap. Join Mark Itell next week for more thrilling, edge of your seat discussions about real estate and mortgages right here on the Mr. Mortgage Show.